Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we'll pray and, and get rolling. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word and for the privilege it is to come together tonight and open it up. We ask, Lord, that you would be our teacher, that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide, that you, Father, would um, take us into the truth of your word and may it uh, change us. May we be drawn to you. May our um, love for you and the awe of who you are increase tonight. Um, we pray that our time together would be encouraging to everyone here and those watching online, that uh, we would know that we've been in the presence of our, our King and our Savior. Um, help us to not be in the way of what you have for us tonight. Um, we eagerly come to receive from you the words of life. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. We are in um, Mark 12, and uh, last week we started the chapter, and we looked through 1 through 17, and this is um, one of the three traps that the Sanhedrin are setting for Jesus. They want to trap Jesus into making a statement that will indict him and worry Rome and get him arrested. Um, and they've done this before. You may remember like early in the ministry when uh, the Pharisees and scribes approached him and they um, had set this up with um, catching a, a woman in adultery. And it's where Jesus said, let the one without sin cast the first stone. These are the same guys. They're bringing questions to try to trap him. They've been doing this um, his whole ministry. But this last week of, of his earthly life, there's three times that the Sanhedrin send a group to try to trap him. Last week, it was the Pharisees and the Herodians, and um, they come with this trap for Jesus and... Uh, um, he destroys it, right? Um, it, it's fascinating to think uh, that these men thought that they could come up with a trap that would trick God. Um, but here we are, and they're taking a swing at it again. And um, this time, um, they are sending from the Sanhedrin some Sadducees. So this is still Wednesday of... Passover week, and they send the Sadducees for this second trick question. This is our passage, Mark 12, 18 through 27. Some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife, and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Then they present this, this absurd uh, hypothetical question. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children, and the third likewise, and so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses... In the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. I have to tell you, when I started studying, whenever I study, I try to read and then just uh, um, chase questions. And... Uh, um, I'm trying to be a couple weeks ahead, and this one was really hard, hard for me. And uh, um, and so, what I hope 
I can walk us through is I went from, uh, this is kind of a difficult, messy section, and I've come to a place where today I, I was very excited to share what I think the scripture teaches us here. Um, and I think over and over what I'm learning, and I hope it's spilling over for all of us, is that when we do good study, um, the Word does that for us. Um, we want to know what the Word says, um, not what I say, but what the Word teaches us. And it, um, when we see how it is connected and we see the thread of the story through all of Scripture, it is an astounding, astounding thing that is a great, great blessing to me this week. And I'm excited about where this was. So, the Sadducees. One of the things that's difficult about the study is that we don't know much about the Sadducees. Historically, um, we know more about the Pharisees than the Sadducees. Um, we don't have any writings from the Sadducees. Um, so we don't have anything f directly from their voice. But we have the New Testament and we have um, non-biblical historical texts that talk about the Sadducees. And from that, we learn these things. And our text begins that way. That some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus. The Sadducees believe that um, there's no resurrection. And because there's no resurrection, there's no judgment. And there's no need. There's no afterlife. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There are no angels, no spirits, no demons, and no supernatural. And they believe only in the physical world. So when a person dies, they would debate if there was a soul because they couldn't physically quantify it. The soul would die with them. And that's the end. And it is really interesting that... Um, you know, none of this is, biblic is a biblical view. The beliefs that they held, none of them are a biblical view. And it's interesting how closely their beliefs look like atheism. Um, maybe you thought that when we went through there. It is interesting that the Sadducees are Jews who are practicing um, a form of Judaism, but they hold to these beliefs only in the physical world. And to, to do this, they have to exclude much of Scripture. And this is one of the points I think is important for us um, to capture. They, um, they may sound Jewish, but their views are not anything like Judaism. Um, we see this today in uh, sometimes um, even churches that have um, compromised their, the foundation of their faith. Sometimes you'll see them described as a, a progressive Christian church. And often it is a church that um, is no longer a church because they have taken all the miraculous, all the supernatural out and only believing in the, in the physical world. And what that does to faith is it is this um, um, name your own adventure kind of faith. <laughs> um, there's no longer a standard for truth um, when you can edit and exclude what isn't culturally acceptable to you. So here we have the Sadducees, no resurrection. There's no judgment. Uh, they, would, they would say that um, your judgment is during, you suffer during this life for sin, um, that it's a direct cause and effect. But there's no judgment at the end because there's no hell, there's no afterlife. No heaven, no angels, no spirits, no demons. And one of the ways the Sadducees would imitate Jewish belief is that they would redefine 
words of core truth to the Jewish faith. So the word resurrection, which they do not believe, um, they would redefine that word to be um, someone uh, starting over, not um, the actual physical resurrection that is promised in Scripture. They don't believe in that. Jesus is fully aware that they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in anything supernatural. And they come to him and they're trying to use Moses to build their trap for Jesus. And um, I want us to stay in uh, looking at historical and the words before we jump to application, but I want us to see along the way how even today, um, cult and all, all from the first century to today, this isn't new today, culture will redefine words of truth to give them a definition that better fits a cultural worldview. So the trick question that the Sadducees present is this um, absurd scenario. They come, they, they approach him again, just like the first trap that we hit last week with this fake respect. They call him teacher. Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to the brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children. And the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. They're presenting this. And these men think that they have crafted this impossible dilemma, this conundrum for Jesus. He has no way out of this. This is a really clever trap they feel they are setting. Last of all, the woman died alone. In the resurrection, which they don't believe in, this mocking and scoffing in their question, when they rise again, in case Jesus didn't know what the resurrection meant, <laughs> which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Um, they, had, they had worked together to come up with this trap this question for Jesus. In the Old Testament passage that they're, they are leveraging for their question is from Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 6. And the, the cultural construct that they are talking about that Moses put in place is called a Leviar marriage. And Leviar um, does not have anything to do with the Levites. Leviar is a word that means bro brother-in-law. So it's a brother-in-law marriage. And this is a historical context that is really weird for us. And, um, but we need to understand this to try to get a, a grip on what they're saying. So brace yourself for some weirdness. This is the passage they're referencing. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 through 10. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son... The wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go in to her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders, pull his sandal off his foot, spit in his face, and she shall declare, Thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. That's what he's dealing with. And this is 
so different than our culture, right? Um, part of his punishment was to have his sandal removed and get spit on and if he wouldn't perform this duty. And um, we need to understand that it was important when Moses set this structure up, it was important to the community. There, just like in the story, no one mentions this poor woman who had seven brothers who married her. Um, what she had, even though it's a hypothetical, just that poor lady, right? Um, in the culture, um, there are still no last names. So you are Jordan of Midland. And if he has brothers and he passes away, his wife couldn't own the land and probably would not get remarried because marriages were agreed upon in families. And if she can't own land and she can't get married, her options then are very slim. If she's in a bigger village, it's possible that she could work as a servant. And a servant is not like when we talk today about the, the blight of human slavery. A servant in the first century was a, um, a subsistence survival agreement that benefited both people. So a servant may help tend to the animals or help with the crops, but their wage is that they have food and a place to live. And without that, they would be homeless. And homeless in the first century, there are no social constructs. There are no social services. Um, there's, there's no help. Um, this mechanism of the Leviar marriage, this brother-in-law marriage, was a kindness and an act of compassion to help a widow who would have risked poverty and homelessness. And if they had a son, it would carry on the name of the brother, which would mean the, he would be the heir to the land that his dad owned. She wouldn't lose everything. Yeah, Kelly. It's a weird question. The brothers have to be single? Yes. They, you know, they the brothers had to be single. It wasn't like you take another one. No. No, that was not the plan. Yep. A brother needed to be single. It's only valid if the brother's single when the other passed away to continue the family line. And this this seems odd to us, but I want you to connect the dots with the story of Ruth and Boaz. Because this is exactly the situation Ruth finds herself in. Her husband has died. She has no other relatives. There's no other brothers. His other brother died. It's just, just her and Naomi. And when she and Boaz come together, Boaz is related to her father. So he is kin. He's not a brother-in-law, but he's the only kinsman redeemer, Scripture calls it, that's left. And if you remember, Boaz goes to the gate and he says, this is my intention. I am the only kinsman. I'm going to marry Ruth. But he has to tell the elders at the gate in case there are any other relatives who might be closer in line. And there were not. And Boaz marries Ruth who prior to this is homeless and wandering in the edge of the field for the scraps of grain. And now because of this mosaic construct to socially care for a widow, she marries her kinsman redeemer, Boaz, related to her father. And Boaz and Ruth have baby Obed. And Obed has Jesse, and Jesse has David. And David, through that line, is a great, great, great grandfather of Joseph in the line of Jesus. So even in the family line of 
Mary and Joseph and Jesus, there is this exact situation with the lady our marriage because of Boaz and Ruth. Um, today, we have uh, social services, we have wills, we have a legal construct where um, home and property isn't taken away, um, we have beneficiaries, um, they had none of that. And it would have been a devastating moment for a widow um, looking at homelessness in a culture where literally the subsistence living was everybody's life. Um, you farmed, you milked goats, you, um, you didn't go buy stuff, right? So um, if, you, if you didn't have land to grow stuff on, you, you didn't get, get food. So um, receive that as, boy, that's weird for us. <laughs> but also see, I, I think that's just um, to see that this thing that seems so strange to us is actually part of the line of David. Um, and it's part of why we have the story of Ruth and all that explained following the Mosaic Law. So here we have the Sadducees. They take this common cultural law, the Leviar marriage, this Mosaic construct, and they build this hypothetical trick question about this poor woman who has to marry seven brothers, and they, they're at the end, at the resurrection, when they rise, which one's wife will she be? For she married all seven. So I want us to see in their question that this is not unlike skepticism today. Um, it, it's okay to, I encourage you to have doubts and questions. The truth can endure any inquiry, but there's a different kind of critical skepticism that um, uses sarcasm and scoffing to make scripture look silly and um, to present um, hypothetical situations where it appears that heaven doesn't work and scripture doesn't work. Um, there is a pastor that um, um, used to be in uh, our state and became pretty influential and um, sadly started um, leaning towards that fully, he's fully in to that progressive Christian uh, distortion of truth. And one of the, he has a video that he put out and he, he says this, and this is the kind of skeptic uh, scoffing question that mocks scripture in heaven. He, he says, um, imagine Gandhi and he leverages that people don't know very much about Gandhi, but the culture thinks Gandhi is a really righteous guy. And so he says, imagine Gandhi, that he could be in hell. Can you imagine that a good God would, would send Gandhi to hell? And he leverages this to expound on, eventually he says that there's no hell. <laughs> that because God is good and loving, it's impossible that there is hell. Um, which is not a biblical view. It's, it's a Sadducee view um, where there's no afterlife. And it's deceptive because in our human emotions of fairness, people who don't know anything about Gandhi might just know the name and think he, he, was, a, he was a good guy. <laughs> and how could a good guy be in hell? Um, I'm just wrestling with <laughs> what I'm supposed to share. Um, when, we, when we see questions like that that present this, like, um, I found this, this question where heaven doesn't work, where scripture doesn't work, so we're going to throw the whole thing away. 
um, what that reveals is exactly what Christ said to the Sadducees, that you don't understand Scripture and you don't understand the power of God. We have to, um, in humility um, and confidence, <laughs> receive the, the truth that there is no created person that can trick the creator. It doesn't matter um, who they are or how many there are <laughs> or how long they work on the question. Um, we are not going to, oh, gotcha, God. That's where it doesn't work. But that's where the critical skeptic lives. Um, the critical skeptic will will say, you know, um, the Bible was written by men, and men are fallible. I don't know why God would use fallible men to write the Bible. So if fallible men wrote the Bible, um, I can't trust it. And usually the thought stops right there. Because if you keep thinking in that way, you get to the place where well, some man told me that I can't trust the Bible and he's a fallible man. And uh, I'm, I'm a man and I'm fallible. So I just discovered that I can't trust myself. <laughs> so I can't trust the view that I just came to that I can't trust other... And but critical skepticism never goes all the way around the circle. And the Sadducees are right there in that spot. They think that they have this impossible question for Jesus. Yes? Did you say they were sent? They were the second? Yep. Uh, but they were sent by? The Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin. the Sanhedrin sent them. So there's this council of 70 um, not at all, isn't that? But, but they thought, he, that maybe they could, they thought they could, he could, they could trick him. So their views do not align with the Pharisees, um, but and they are a minority in Israel, and it's very interesting, even extrapolating out from the first century to today. This minority group has a tremendous influence on the Sanhedrin, the highest court for Israel. Um, no Pharisees believe any of this. Um, the Sanhedrin um, knows this and they are sent separately th thinking they can trick Jesus. And Jesus gives them this straight indictment in this biblical answer. He said, verse 24, Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken? that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God. This is a tremendous rebuke. These are the men who um, feel that they know scripture better than anybody else in the room. <laughs> and Jesus starts his answer with, the reason you're mistaken is you don't understand scripture or the power of the God. And what they do to hold these beliefs of no resurrection, no judgment, no afterlife, no angels, no spirit, no supernatural, they have to edit the Bible. And the Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh. This is the name for the whole Hebrew Bible. And the Hebrew Bible is divided into three sections. The Torah, which you, we've talked about, you've heard about the Torah as the First five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Navi, which is um, uh, the prophets, all the prophets. And then the Ketuvim, which is Psalms and Proverbs and um, Lamentations. And these three sections are the whole of the Hebrew Bible. When Jesus is teaching in the temple, 
when he quotes scripture, he considers all of this scripture. And this is a, this is important to us that Jesus considered this scripture when he quoted this. All the Pharisees, all the scribes, all the elders hold that all of this is scripture. But for the Sadducees to hold their belief in only the physical world and not the supernatural, they only believe these five books are scripture. And the Sadducees say that all the rest of these books are commentary on these five. So this is what happens um, with this, this skepticism and uh, when they deny the afterlife, they make the word of God conform to their view. Because we do not believe in the resurrection and we do not believe in the afterlife, we don't believe in judgment, we are not going to observe or submit to any of this part of the Bible. We only like this part. And um, they took great pride in being experts in these five books. They were, they were more strict about the Mosaic law than the Pharisees, if that is even possible. <laughs> but to make their view work, they had to edit Scripture. And this is an important um, point for us. Um, we need to align to all of Scripture. We do not make Scripture align with us. Scripture should censor me. I should never censor Scripture. Scripture should edit me. <laughs> there are things in me that should be removed, but there's nothing in Scripture that should be edited. We need a working faith that aligns with the whole of Scripture. So when we look at this, um, they only choose these five books and they don't recognize the rest of this is Scripture. Um, it's another conflict they have um, with the Pharisees, with the rest of the Sanhedrin. Um, the Jews believed in the full resurrection. And the understanding of the resurrection is throughout Scripture. In, in the Navi, in Exodus 37, there is the whole account of uh, the vision of dry bones. And um, in the vision of dry bones, um, they see the dry bones as Israel. In the, in the vision, they are breathed upon by God and these dry bones come to life, resurrected to life. And the first century Jewish uh, religious leaders believed that this represented the nation of Israel and that God would raise from death to victory and glory. And as part of that expectation that we've talked about, that a Messiah was coming to be a political leader. They saw that in Ezekiel. Um, but they believed in the resurrection. They believed the Messiah would come and they believed that the resurrection would be the end result of his return. In the Ketuvim, um, in Job 19, and Job is the most ancient um, of the books, the oldest that we have. The Ketuvim has Job 19, and he says, As for me, verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my, sin, my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see, see God. He believed in the resurrection, whom I myself, myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. In Psalm 16, there's several psalms that we'll look at. Psalm 16 says, If you say, how, how shall we persecute him? And I'm sorry. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also 
will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life and the presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there's pleasure forever. Um, the first century church believed in resurrection. Um, Psalm 49 says, verse 14, God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Um, Psalm 139, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. And in the, in the, the Nive, we have Isaiah 26. Where's my Isaiah? Isaiah 26 says, Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. So the prophets wrote about resurrection. And maybe one that you, you know, Daniel 12 Daniel 12, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting content. So in Daniel, we have both the belief of resurrection and the belief in judgment and an afterlife. It's important for us to understand um, and see the, the danger of this that is still happening today. Um, there is a, um, a modern uh, famous president who, um, when talking about um, gender and um, same-sex relationships, said that he thought the Sermon on the Mount was a more significant guide than some obscure verses in Romans. And, and what that's doing is exactly what the Sadducees do. I'm going to pick the places in Scripture that agree with me. And I'm going to discount or even remove the places in Scripture that are troublesome because they don't align with me. We need to guard our hearts from that. Um, and uh, we're going to get to a spot tonight that it'll be hard for us because of that. Um, the Sadducees are denying the supernatural. There's no resurrection. And in doing so, they have to exclude much of the Hebrew Bible. Um, this has happened uh, throughout generations. Um, movements have been made where the miracles are taken out of the Bible and it's just um, physical world and it's just good moral teaching and there's really no um, no accountable position for judgment because um, you just need to try to do a good job <laughs> um, and that kind of thinking is still happening today um, and we need to connect this um, this is a big deal when Jesus said is this not the cause of your trouble? You do not understand scriptures or the power of God. Um, whenever we step outside of the full truth of scripture and we adjust scripture to meet our expectations, to align with our viewpoints, to align with our opinions, we need to take that very, very seriously because Jesus did. We need to recall that when Peter voiced a human thought, a widely agreed upon human opinion, that the Messiah would come to conquer Rome and be an earthly king. When Jesus is telling the apostles in Mark 8, verse 31, we looked at this, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He was stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, 
Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. This is where the Sadducees are. They took their view that all things are physical, there's no supernatural. They choose to ignore the passages of the Bible that don't align with their viewpoint. And it's, it's not unlike the thinking of many today, the idea that um, this is my truth, that somehow allows me to edit or delete what God has said. It's no different than what the Sadducees are doing. Um, just as Jesus rebuked Peter for overlaying his expectations and his viewpoint and his human thought on the plan of God, um, we need to hear those words of Jesus when we are tempted to exclude a part of Scripture because it's difficult to make it align with our view. And hear Jesus say, Get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. We need to be sober-minded. We, we need to have a greater fear of God than of any human thinking opinion. Jesus rebukes the Sadducees, and he said, verse 25, For when they rise from the dead, addressing their question, Jesus said, They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush how God spoke to him? Um, in Jesus' answer, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Um, This is the spot where I wrestled with. Um, I like being married. And there's a lot of sentimental um, emotion about what heaven will be like that has been presented to all of us. Um, we imagine grandma and grandpa together. Um, and, and we imagine that things will be like they used to be, but better. And Jesus says, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Um, we can't skip that part just because I didn't like it, right? Or there I am with the Sadducees. Yeah. Yeah, but what, at the resurrection, I won't be. We won't be married in the resurrection. And this is why. <laughs> Marriage is a construct of God for earth. And in Genesis, it says it's not good that the man is alone. And he needs a helper. And there's someone who's equal, who's part of him, right? And they together are given this responsibility to procreate, to fill the earth, and to care for it. That was our first job. <laughs> um you can fill in all the stuff the ways we have messed up both. If God gives us a job to care for it and to procreate and all that is against both those things. When the end comes and we are all resurrected physically, that event, that one singular event, when the dead in Christ rise, those who are belonging to Jesus are invited into the kingdom of God and scripture describes it as the wedding supper of the Lamb. We as a whole, as a church, are described as the bride of Christ. 
We are no longer married to one another because heaven is only populated once by the resurrection. No babies will be born in heaven. And there will be no need. <laughs> and in heaven, we are united with Jesus. We, as a whole, are the bride of Christ, married to no other. In heaven, as hard as this was to wrestle through, because I like being married. And it actually feels like a sad thought to not be. <laughs> Somehow, in heaven, it will be better and more beautiful and more joyous and more satisfying than I can imagine. And for people who have lost those in marriage, um, for those who are single, all of it is an earthly construct. And when we are united in glory, we are all equally brought in as part of the family. Just like this kinsman redeemer, <laughs> We are related to Jesus. And we are taken in and the Father receives the bride and the bridegroom. And the wedding supper of the Lamb, this marriage feast, goes on and on and on. I love the ending. I've always loved the ending. <laughs> <laughs> but I really wrestled with they'll not be given in marriage. Um, we will know each other. We will know each other. We'll recognize each other. When he says that when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven... The way we are like angels in heaven is that angels are not married. Not married. That's the place where I wrestled this week. Your problem is you don't understand scripture. <laughs> or the power of God. And that somehow this plan of God is better than my sentimental longing. It's better than, you know, the hurt that a heart feels thinking about that. We will be reunited, but in a better way. The Sadducees ask this question and uh, they, don't, they don't understand Scripture. And we started, um, I think it was the third week, I've got copies, it's a circle chart. It's this, uh, the core issues need to be the foundation of our faith. The core issues are based on the apostles' teaching. Um, when the authority was taken away from the elders in the temple, that authority was given to the apostles at Pentecost. And from that point on at Pentecost, they didn't study the rabbis' teachings. It wasn't a new rabbinic Judaism. They studied the apostles' teachings. And from that moment in Acts on, that was the beginning of why we're here tonight. Still studying the apostles' teachings. It's core to what we are. Secondly, less important than the core, biblical commands. 
Next one down, far less important than biblical commands, personal convictions. Next one, theologically debatable. Um, how did Adam cut his toenails? Not a, nothing that will save you or not a question you'll be asked. It's theologically debatable. If you have an opinion about it, that's even less important. <laughs> and if you and I disagree on how it might have happened, that's even less important. But what happens in the world is this gets completely backwards. This becomes the most important. This becomes the strongest distinguishing factor about who you are and your identity. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Are you on this side of the disagreement or this side? <laughs> and, it, and it automatically means something about you. If you're on this side, it means you're right. If you're on this side, it means you hate. <laughs> but if we can hold to the core of all of Scripture, hold to the truth of God's Word, and have our lives conform to it, instead of us shaping the word to fit us, then we can live here with peace and confidence, even in a hard teaching, like thinking about being in heaven and not being married. When they asked about marriage, they believed that their view that there's no resurrection, no afterlife, was so true because they believed it with all their heart <laughs> that this was the trap that Jesus couldn't answer. To them, it seemed like a real problem. This is an unsolvable solution because my view is that there's no resurrection. Opinions and strong feelings are not the authority for truth. A super strong opinion does not create truth. Truth is not created. <laughs> truth is Jesus. They are coming to him with a truth based on their opinion. This is my truth. There's no resurrection, no judgment, no afterlife. And they're talking to the very one who told us in John that I am the way and the truth and the life. This is the very, this is the very one. <laughs> These Sadducees know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, even though they deny the resurrection. When, um, when Jesus was called by Martha and Mary and said, Lazarus is sick. When he gets there, he's passed away. He's placed in a cave and a stone is rolled in front of it. We need to see that Jesus, the one who is God made flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, who sees the whole plan. He's told the disciples many times he's going to Jerusalem. He'll be arrested and mocked, beaten, He's standing now in Bethany, just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. And think about what Jesus is seeing. It's a cave with a stone in front of it and a dead man inside. And it says at the beginning of that passage that many Jews from Jerusalem were there mourning with Mary and, and Martha. John 11, verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would have, would have died. And even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, this is testimony of first century Jews believing the resurrection. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. So think about this moment in our passage in Mark 12. The Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection are talking to the one who is the resurrection. He doesn't say, I bring resurrection. He doesn't say, I know how to do it. <laughs> he says, I am 
resurrection? And this is the trick question. We need to be astounded at his grace. (laughs) That they would bring this arrogant trap to the one who is the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha said, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. So notice this. (laughs) Jesus who knows as he's going to Jerusalem that his crucifixion awaits and he knows that he'll be placed in a tomb with a stone in front of it. He knows that he is the Lamb of God sent to take away the sin of the world. Verse 31, John 11. The Jews who were with her, Martha, in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary and Martha got up quickly and went out, they followed them, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore Mary came where Jesus was, and she saw him and fell at his feet. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her from Jerusalem also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the sea, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes, and he said this. He prays, and he is knowing what's going to happen in Jerusalem. He knows what's happening in our passage in Mark 12 that we're studying tonight. And he knows that the Jews from Jerusalem are there listening. And this is how Jesus prays. Uh, 41b, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. He prayed intentionally so that the crowd would hear him and would see this work that he is the resurrection. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings in his face, wrapped around with a cloth, and Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Here's verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. And here he stands in front of these, the Sadducees who deny the resurrection, who know about Lazarus. This same Sanhedrin had even talked about we should kill Lazarus too. These men think they have a trick question that will catch Jesus about the resurrection. Jesus said, Is this not the reason you're mistaken? You don't understand Scripture or the power of God. When we get tempted to hold a view, an opinion, even a personal conviction as something precious and guiding in our life, because it's more comfortable, maybe it's more, um, it's it's well-received in culture, so it's an easier view to hold, we risk being a Sadducee and 
creating our own truth out of our own opinion. This error is uh, because we don't understand Scripture. <laughs> and it's, it's the trap that Satan sets for all people who are deceived in thinking that if they believe something, they can make it true. Dallas Willard uh, taught philosophy at USC and um, from a lecture he gave uh, on his website, it's uh, dwillard.org, Truth, Can We Do Without It? This is the article. He says this, No one has ever yet made a belief true by believing it. Try it. Try making a belief true just by believing it or by having an attitude of some sort towards it. Believe there's gas in your tank, it won't help. Get two other people to believe it with you. Start a political movement, the gas in the tank movement. It won't help. <laughs> of course you can put gas in your tank, but you can't do it by believing it. You can't put gas in your tank by being favorably, favorably disposed to believing that there's gas in the tank. Or doing anything else in the way of mere belief. The structure of matching up or not matching, and he said this is how we identify truth. What it does is it actually uh, affects us by what we believe, and that's why the statement, true for me, is a destructive statement. What it does is actually substitute belief for truth. Belief, of course, is relative, Proposition is believed only if someone believes it, but you can't truth a belief by believing it. You can't make a fact exist just by believing it. The Sadducees are doing that. By ignoring most of the Hebrew Bible and holding the opinion that it's only the physical world and there's nothing else. They stand before Jesus and um, it doesn't matter how strongly they feel about it or how much will they can put behind believing it, they cannot create truth. They are so um, committed to their belief about there being no resurrection that in the book of Acts, when Peter and John are preaching, they get arrested because they're preaching about the resurrection. This is Acts 4, verse 1. As Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees, the same group, came to them. They being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they laid hands on them and put them in jail. This was a big deal to them. They needed to um, eliminate anyone who was preaching truth <laughs> that didn't align with their truth. Acts 5, 17, the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in the public jail. We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. This is the challenge for us um, as we walk through this passage. It's to... Submit to Scripture and to the authority and the power of God. It is to receive what God has for us as truth. Jesus takes um, their opinion and he, they hold to the first five books of the Bible and he quotes from Exodus to correct them. And he says, have you not read the passage about Moses? And he tells them where 
when he was talking to God in the burning bush, where God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of the living, not the dead. Even the thin foundation that they had built on these first five books, he uses to correct the air in their thinking. So as you pursue God, as you pursue faith, um, we need to be a people seeking to understand Scripture and to understand the power of God and be fully submitted to it. Let's pray, and then I'll talk about anything you want. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Um, I pray continually that if there's anything that is not of you, that we would forget it, but that it would cling to the words of life, that we'd find uh, encouragement and peace in there, and uh, that we'd be more and more in awe of how you love us and care for us. Thank you, Father, for your word and for this time tonight. Amen.